Good evening, I'm Ralph Rennick. We have a special montage program for you this evening because this is a special night. There's no other time of the year that brings such a warmth of goodwill, such a feeling of brotherhood as this eve of Christmas. Many of the stories we have brought you through this year have had another story behind them, a story about the people themselves and how our montage staff felt about them personally as they worked on their stories. Tonight, we take this opportunity to tell you a little of the story behind the story on montage. Here's Joe Abel. We struggled about what to bring you tonight because, of course, it is Christmas Eve and a very special time of year, and we perhaps thought you were tired of Christmas carols, even though there is more to follow this evening. But we thought montage should express in a more positive and a special way what the Christmas spirit is as we celebrate tonight. So through the eyes and the words of our staff members, some of whom you never see on television, we're going to tell kind of a Christmas story. It's a story montage has told in many ways through the lives of many people this past year. And we hope that it demonstrates once again the beauty and the grandeur, really, of the human spirit. So let's see the Christmas spirit as we have seen it this past year on montage. Our first story deals with something that sometimes is humorous to some people, dentures. But in our denture story, as we sometimes call it, we found a beautiful man and a beautiful sense of spirit, what we're talking about this Christmas Eve. The East Coast Dental Society had taken it upon itself to provide free dentures to people who didn't have teeth and who couldn't afford new dentures. And when our chief cinematographer, Glenn Kirkpatrick, produced and shot the story, he found quite an unexpected man and situation. What was it? Alan Stephen was the main surprise. He was a 77-year-old man that I met in the waiting room and volunteered after I asked him to let us film him for four weeks. And he did it without much thought. Uh, actually, just with a twinkle in his eye, a little smile, I said, sure, go ahead. Well, over those four weeks, and actually more, what kind of a man did you find him to be? He was very easy to be with, just a very warm, congenial person. Uh, he had a God-centered philosophy that he believed in, uh, well, if you and I even don't agree, we still may see the good in each other and can get along very easily. So he and his story kind of represented the spirit we're talking about tonight. And I think let's let Alan Stevens speak for himself the way he did on that original story. That's a good idea. Open. Alan? Okay. How do they feel? Do they feel okay? The top three or five. Yeah, how about the bottom? All right, now. They do? Yeah. Okay. Nice well, they're going to feel funny there for a while, you know, this is wax. The next time will be your finished product, okay? All my life I was a proud person. And I always uh, felt uh, like I didn't, didn't, I didn't, didn't want to be uh, the worst looking person or uh, anything of that sort. I, I always tried to stay on the front among the good-looking peoples of my folks. And uh, we, uh, until I got rid of all my teeth and first one thing and another, and all these different kind of complaints got a hold to me, I ain't, I, I try to stay away from them as much as I can. He didn't have to act, he just looked himself, which is difficult to do in front of the lens. But unfortunately, about a month after this story aired, Alan died of a stroke, and it touched the staff very deeply. Oh boy. Who is this? This ain't none of me. <laughs> who is that young man? I don't know who this is. Don't call him no young man. You may get ideas in his head. <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. Ain't that nice? Oh, thank God. All these good doctors and good nurses and good everybody, good people, sure got me looking good now. Oh, you can talk big now. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> it, it looked so nice to me. I don't know how it looked to nobody else, but God knows it looked nice to me. Well, I think that certainly demonstrates the spirit of an individual, uh, and we see that every day. Perhaps we don't really see it, but we've demonstrated it's there to see if we care to look. But how about a community? Does a community have a spirit? Does Fort Lauderdale or Palm Beach or Miami or whatever town you would want to name have a spirit, a community spirit? 
A lot of people say it doesn't exist in South Florida, that we're too new or too much of a frontier community to have such a spirit, and we suffer because of it. Well, we decided to try and find out. So I guess, uh, Gary, go ahead and finish your coffee. We should ask the man here, the horse's mouth, Gary Craven, who has produced several specials, montage specials, this past year, and one of them was on community spirit. Is there a community spirit in South Florida, Gary? Well, when we, when we began the program, I don't think we really thought there was a community spirit. People talk about no community involvement and the city is too transient and the city's too young and too diverse yeah. culturally and then it doesn't make a cohesive unit. But you know what we found out, looking at group after group of people and family after family, we found out that maybe the reason the city has grown so fast and is so diverse is because it is a good place to live and the people who have come to live here appreciate that. And I think that's what community spirit really is. Well, that, isn't that interesting? Because maybe in looking for such a thing as spirit, which is kind of a, an ethereal thing to look for, it is. Yeah. we don't see it when we find it. And you kind of found but it's it there. in spite of itself. It's there. Yeah. And if you get to know the people in the community, they say it really well themselves. And that's what we did in our program. We had the people in the community talk for themselves. An example is uh, Mrs. Lenny Robinson, who is the elementary school teacher that we did at Caribbean Elementary. You think she puts it pretty well? She had a good way with words, and she knew what she wanted to say. There is nothing that I can imagine more exciting or more rewarding than watching children learn. You, you were watching a reading group. There was a child in that reading group that came into my class last year. He had never spoken, let alone read. He had never said anything to anyone. And he is one of the most animated, outgoing children in that group. And you just, you couldn't give me another job that would be more exciting than to see what's happened to that child. heart is, Lenny Robinson has two homes, her family and Caribbean Elementary's third grade class. There is nothing that equals that smile on a child's face or walking into class as I did today and finding sitting on my desk a little note that said, I love you. Home. When you live in the country, you want to see the city. When you live in the city, you want to see the country. But when you have seen the place you do not know, you want to go home to the place you do know. Beautiful. Well, I think from community spirit, which I, I hope we've demonstrated there is some of in South Florida, we move to a spirit that revolves around an, another community, but the one that's very closed, and one that deals with some problems. We'll interrupt Lynn Cava cleaning her trusty camera here because she has a very special observation on a story we did on Operation Reentry of young people who are dealing with their problems with drugs, and she found spirit very much alive in Operation Reentry. It was really beautiful. It started from the very beginning. I was very impressed with the kids. We pulled up in the car and there were a couple of guys outside waiting to uh, help me with all my equipment and every place I went somebody was offering. They insisted to help me. Not just and, because uh, you're a very beautiful woman. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, they were always very friendly saying hi and um, at the very end of the two days we were shooting the counselor called us into one of the big meeting rooms and Nancy and I, the producer, we walked in and everybody stood up and they gave us an ovation and thanked us and then they sang songs for us. It was beautiful. Well, that's great. Let's look at a little portion of that, that segment. See okay. what you're talking about. Why are you wearing that sign, Amy? Because two nights ago I went out and got high. You went out and smoked marijuana? Yeah, I smoked a joint. Why did you do that? After all your time that you spend here trying to learn not to do that? Uh, because I felt really depressed and lonely and I don't know, I got... I just wanted to go out and get high, and I went out and I smoked a joint. 
So this is your punishment? Yeah. How long do you have to wear it? I have no idea. Will you do it again, do you think? No, I know it. Just 30,000 things at once, everything happening. In meetings called games, emotions quickly surface. The object is total honesty between peers. Ruth is being asked to explain her recent moody behavior and quick temper. Say, the rest of us could do that, and sure, there's going to be times we're going to be uptight, but you've been doing it a lot in the past few days. You know, all the crap. I went through so much last time that I went back to school, you know? And it took me a long time to get used to it. Now it's, it's all starting all over from day one again. With going back to school, and I have so much crap about that, you know? You, you know what to do. I don't see why you're not doing it. I don't see why you're still doing these things, still blowing up and, and, and getting mad at people. Before I came into the program, I was just like, my day consisted of, you know, going to school, getting high, and just hanging around my house. And it's like now, I, you know, I've, I've met more people and I found more about myself and what I really got in myself and, you know, like, a lot of people have good in themselves that they don't even know is there. And it's just like, I'm here trying to find out what that is. And, you know, I think I'm learning a lot. Maury? Oh, hi, Jim. Let me interrupt you here for a minute. And, oh, uh, OK. You know, we're looking back this year to some stories that had more than the normal significance to us. And uh, I think the story you had about a doctor who learned he had cancer was quite a story. Tell us about mm -hmm. it. It really was. Yeah. It's um, one of the most moving stories I've ever done. And it surprised me because when you first told me about this man, you told me that he was a man who had just found out he had terminal cancer. Uh, and he was a doctor who had been spending a lot of time recently telling other doctors how to deal with patients who have cancer. And now he had cancer and he was learning really what it's like. Well, I was very down about this because I wasn't looking forward to doing a story about a guy with, who was dying. You know, sure. it, it's a very depressing thing. But when I called him up, I discovered not a person who was dying, but a person who's making living his business. And in fact, in fact, he was so busy, he hardly had time to let us film him. We had to, we had to go to where he was working and film him busy um, at the hospital teaching residents how to work with children and so forth. He's a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. This guy was going about living like nobody I've ever seen. Yeah. And we got the, the whole philosophy from him that when, when you find out you have cancer, one of the most important things you can do is to get it into your head that you're not going to let cancer take your life, that you're going to go on living and you're going to beat it. And in fact, that's exactly what he's done. We didn't know this at the time. He was just fighting the disease. But I, I just talked to him a couple of days ago, and he told me that he's now finished his complete chemotherapy treatment. And the doctors say that for several months now, he's been in complete remission. He has no further signs of the disease. And he's just going right on. And in fact, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. He's, he's a big, the man is a living Santa Claus. The, the way he looks, the way he acts. Right. And he was starting to lose weight, and he was losing his hair. And it was, it was a little bit pathetic because of the, the treatments. And now he's, he's gaining weight again, and he's got all his hair back, he told me. It's just great. Just in time for Christmas. To look right, like yeah. Well, that's Dr. Elliot Poodall. But let's look back at the story we did a few months past and see what it was like then. OK, I've, I've got that up here. Great. So. No cough or any problems? No, no cough. I'm sleeping well at night. His treatment is an injection of five experimental drugs. It's a painful process, and he's generally quite ill the entire next day. Like many cancer patients, he sometimes feels that the treatment is worse than the disease, and he's had to be his own psychiatrist. I've worked it out first by being very angry, angry at myself for having a disease process like this that I had nothing to do with. Then I worked it out by saying, I'm going to defeat this psychologically. I'm going to live as fully as I can, and I'm going to defeat this disease with the help of the drugs, but also psychologically, I've got to do something. And, and this has been shown in many uh, articles that have come out recently that the attitude that the person has with malignancy has a great influence on the outcome of the disease. I'm living as normal a life as I did before they made this diagnosis. Um, I, and, uh, and obviously you're, you're, you're working on living. 
Yes, uh, I'm enjoying living more. I think that uh, each day I enjoy everything I do because I, I know that it means much more. At least I was given more life to live. And above all, Elliot Podal plans to go right on living. A remission means that you suddenly the disease process is stopped temporarily. But with these new drugs now, given in combination, they're talking about cure. And I'm looking forward to that. Well, great story. Great Christmas gift for all of us. The Dr. Podol is doing much better. It certainly is. And for everybody else who, who uh, has the dragon, as it's been called, to know that there's hope and that it's not all hopeless. Mm-hmm. Great. Now to a little lighter subject, inventions and inventors. Ah, yes. Your favorite subject, Maury. Mm -hmm. A few months back, I came to you and said, we have all these letters that we continually get about people who have inventions. So let's start a regular inventor's corner which is your domain, and uh, you take it from there. Yes, well, uh, I, I guess that that was kind of my domain. I've done four of those now this year. Of how many different inventors? Almost over a dozen. Oh, we've right? done over a dozen at yeah. least, right. And I still have a file full that we have never gotten around to yet. And we're still, we're still thinking of those people, so we, we may get to them yet. Right. Um, one of the more interesting ones we did this year was a gentleman named Saul Hackmeyer, who's been working for years on the self-lathering razor, and he's finally got one that really works very well, and he was nice enough to let us film him demonstrating it. The day we went over to film it, I said to him, Saul, don't shave today. We're going to come up, and you're going to shave for us with your razor. So we stood him in front of a mirror, and he took his razor, and it's got a little um, aerosol bottle right in the, in the handle of the razor and the razor, and he stood in front of a mirror with me behind him, and he, like, turns the thing, and then the cream comes out, and he scrapes away at his face. A fantastic thing. The neat thing is... This is a guy who, who just, he loves to invent things, and he's been working on this invention for years. And so far he hasn't had much success marketing it, but he's going to keep on working with that thing, and eventually he's going to get that thing sold and hopefully make a lot of money on it. Well, for the world to see Saul Hackmeyer shaving again, here we go. Let's see. Soap comes out. You lather your face just like you do with a brush or with your hand. If you need more soap, you just press. This even puts the soap into your flesh because with this applicator, it's even more directly applied to your skin than with your hand or even, or well, almost as much as a brush anyway. I guess you wouldn't waste as much either. No, it uses less soap too. That's also true. Now, your face is lathered. And all you do is just turn, out, turn it around to the blade side and shave. Well, why, why was there a need for something like this? Well, why was there a need for the fountain pen? Why not use a bottle with a quill? The idea is to make it more convenient, make it more practical, handier, and reasonable to do the job of shaving. Now, people have to shave usually every day. I'm just rinsing it off. Sorry. And... Uh, as you see, I haven't used, I haven't picked up a can of soap, got my hands all full of soap, and had to, then had to wash them off before I started to shave. The whole thing is, is in my hand. Thank you, Maury. How's that for the inventiveness, pardon the pun, of man? Pretty good, I think. Now, remember this is Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, of course, a time of celebration of a very special birth, and so appropriately we have such a story waiting for us in our main control room. Let's go. Producer Nancy Solomon, we think, uh, had a most appropriate story this past year. Nancy, tell us about it. I did the nurse midwife story. Birth. It really very much moved me. Yeah. This girl, Lucille, was down at uh, Jack's Memorial Hospital. She went around with three other women. We decided we wanted to film one of those actually delivering. And uh, I really like Lucille, especially because she was animated. She really wanted to show the rest of the world how great this program was. Natural childbirth. Natural childbirth. Right. And using the nurse midwife service. Right. But I said, Lucille, I'd love to use you on film. When, can you, when are you going to deliver? We have to film within this week because we're in a budget for time. She says, well, I'm sorry, Nancy. I'm not going to deliver for another three weeks. I said, oh, no. Can't you just speed it up a little? Can't you just try a little bit harder for us? Yeah. She said, I'll try. 
So I went home that night thinking, oh, well, we'll use one of the other women or something, a dummy demonstration, something like that. And sure enough, at 2 o'clock in the morning, that morning, the phone rings. Really? It's Jack's Memorial Hospital. And I'm so groggy, but I say, if you, if you hurry, but you're going to come down and see Lucille. She's in labor right now. I said, Lucille, I've got, I've got to get down there. They said, well, you might as well not even bother. She's just about to deliver. I said, don't tell me that. I'm coming down. So I hung up the phone. I called Glenn, the cameraman. We rushed down there. And sure enough, as soon as we suited up, got ourselves together, she had like 10 minutes to go. We got into the room. And she says, hi, I'm so glad you can make it. I said, I'm glad we can make it, too. Well, interesting, Nancy. A birth is probably the most common thing that we all share, and yet Truly. each time is a, is a great moment. It's isn't a it? miracle, yeah. an honest to goodness miracle, yeah. because this was the first birth that I saw, and I thought it would just be like any other thing, maybe a nice thing. Out comes a baby, but it's not. It's the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen in my life. Well, let's share some of those moments okay. with the audience. Really, Lucille, look at me, Lucille. To push, you take good breath in. In. You keep it and you push on my fingers. You push down below. You bear down. You bear down here. Do you remember how you had your other children? Come on. Start pushing. Start pushing. Oh, you have to push much harder. She's complete. She's ruptured. Oh, I see. I see the head of the baby. Can you push a bit longer and a bit harder? That's pretty good, okay. Okay, you relax between. Uh, I'm putting, putting some local anesthesia around the birth canal so you won't feel the baby coming out. Okay? You understand? Mm -hmm. The same thing. Another injection. Okay. Please do push if you have a contraction. Push a little bit. Give me a push, one push, a good push. That's enough, no more. Did you plan? But don't push. Hand by the door. The head of the baby is out. Okay. One call, time one. Time? That's all right. Push a little bit. Can you push? Enough? Uh, Enough. Uh, Look at your baby. Uh, uh, oh my god. Come on. It's a little boy. Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. No sin? Why did you say that? Well, surely that makes the point we talked about earlier about the human spirit. The joy, the compassion, the understanding, and certainly the love has been demonstrated not only this holiday time, but throughout the year. And we think it makes a very good point that the human spirit and its beauty is alive and well tonight. We'll be right back. Next Saturday night, New Year's Eve, Montage will be on at its regular 7 o'clock time, and then will be followed by Channel 4's live coverage of this year's spectacular Orange Bowl Parade. And now, for all the Montage staff, I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas.